Hi, this is MG Siegler with TechCrunch TV. I'm here today with Jeff Ma. Uh, Jeff has kind of had a very interesting history, which he's going to talk about a little bit. But uh, he's also just written a new book, which he's going to, uh, to tell us a little bit about. So welcome, Jeff. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. So yeah, I thought we'd start off, you know, uh, some people know about your history, obviously. Right. It's, a, it's been a pretty interesting past for you. But if you wanted to go a little bit into that, start talking about kind of how you got um, got involved with uh, everything that you're doing now and, and leading up to this book. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, sort of a, a wild ride, I guess, to some degree. I mean, when I was at MIT in my senior year, I was approached by people that were interested in, in having me play on the MIT Blackjack team. And it's sort of been this, you know, it's one of those like mythical things that you hear about all through MIT. And then right. I got recruited to come be a part of it. And so for the better part of seven years, I was a professional card counter. In 2001, I was done playing, and a lot of us were done playing. We decided to uh, approach a guy by the name of Ben Mesrick, who was a writer at the time. He'd written six novels, but we kind of joke. Ben's career was pretty much in the crapper at that point, and <laughs> you know he was had business school applications out, and was you know this whole writing thing might not have worked out. And he and I decided to write a book called Bring Down the House. And I remember uh, when we were writing it, or when we started to write the proposal. His agent kind of said, "Hey, we could probably sell this, but it's not going to be a big deal. It's not going to be a big, uh, you know, big money maker or anything like that." And of course, that did end up being a big right. Deal. He got a very small advance to do it. Then it ended up spending over a year on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, a movie was made out of it that right. a lot 21. of people have seen called Twenty One. Um, did very well. Made about one hundred fifty million dollars in the box office out of a thirty-five million dollar budget. Um, was number one in the U.S. two weeks in a row. And sort of my life, I was the inspiration for the main character for 21 and the main character in Bringing Down the House. But they changed me to a white dude. So. <laughs> right. It was a little bit controversial. But uh, so speaking of his controversy now, obviously he's written the book The Accidental Billionaires, which mm -hmm. is the book that they're basing the upcoming Facebook movie called right. The Social Network on. Right. So do you have any real like insight into what's going on with that? Have you talked well, to Ben at all? Yeah, I mean, that? I've talked to Ben. I mean, I think that you know the, the people that are involved with that, David Fincher and Aaron Sorkin, it's big time, right. you know, and I think that when we were involved with 21, I think we all loved the fact that we would go on a set, we kind of walk around, everyone kind of knew us and everyone was nice to us. I don't think he's had that same experience with this. I think it's much more of a, of a big time production and right. I think that they have, you know, they have a lot of dollars behind this and it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of talent behind it. So, you know, I think that, you know, Ben has looked at this as, as, a, as sort of a, this is his, you know, this is his big stage. Yeah, sure. Uh, the book was his big stage, and this movie is his, his big stage. So I think that it, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But again, they have so much talent behind it that it's hard to imagine it not being some level of success. Right. It's kind of interesting, though, because Facebook really hasn't been involved with the process at all. Obviously, you were right. working with him on uh, bringing down the house, but right. no one at Facebook is really behind the scenes, you know, right. giving him much feedback or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I think that there were some similarities with how we did uh, bring down the house. Like, I was the sort of integral person involved, kind of telling him all the stories. And I know that he's worked with what Eduardo Saveron and, and on a lot of this stuff. Right, so he talks so to some of the older players. Some of the older players right. and Sean Parker and some of the people. But yeah, no one at Facebook. And there were members of uh, our group that he never spoke with. I mean, one but of the. But that are still in the, the book. Right. The book. I mean, one of the things that probably will go down always in, in a little bit of infamy is the Kevin Spacey character, definitely based off a real person. However, um, person is not a villain by any means. I mean, he's a really good guy. <laughs> And, you know, it definitely had to be kind of, like, that's one of the things people always ask me. Did your professor really steal all your money? Was right. he that big of a jerk? And no, he wasn't. But, I mean, it's the, the things that kind of twisted along the way. And now Zuckerberg gets to be that character probably. I don't know. I yeah. don't know. But, I mean, certainly every movie is going to have a villain. And <laughs> right. uh, maybe Mark is that guy. So for a while, you've been working um, on a startup called Citizen Sports, mm -hmm. sports-based startup. So talk a little bit about that, because obviously you guys were just yeah. recently acquired. Yeah, so um, when I had the notoriety that I gained from bringing down the house. I read the book Moneyball and I decided I really wanted to work in sports. Right. I mean, I thought like this was the thing. I thought there were a lot of parallels between what we were doing in the world of blackjack and what sports teams should be doing and were doing. So we started a company called ProTrade at the time and the goal was to create a way for people to trade athletes like stocks. Mm -hmm. Not only were we doing that, but we did some consulting with teams using statistics to help teams make better decisions. We worked with the Portland Trailblazers. We worked with the San Francisco 49ers. And we had sort of this sports media business that was all based on kind of niche analytics and, and that's statistics. that's kind of the money ball idea. And yeah, exactly. 
And then about three and a half years ago now, or when Facebook opened their platform, uh, we realized that what we were doing had a ceiling and we started building apps on mm -hmm. Facebook and we realized how great it was and how easy it was to build audience on Facebook. So we really just changed the whole company around and got away from sort of the advanced analytics part of it and focused on building experiences where people spend their time already. So that was Facebook, that was the iPhone, that was the Android. And that really changed the company such that, you know, two months ago, Yahoo acquired us and, you know, it was a great deal for everyone. I think it was a, you know, a great testament to what we had built in the three years since we sort of did a course correction. Sure. And what was, um, what was the main impetus behind the Yahoo deal, would you say? I mean, I know you guys were doing things with fantasy sports and stuff and, yeah. and Yahoo's huge in fantasy right. sports. So what was the key driver? I mean, I think there were a few things. I think one, they were concerned about where they were losing people on fantasy and I think they the felt like, yeah I think they felt like that was to Facebook that yeah. was to us they didn't feel like that was as much to ESPN surprisingly mm -hmm. they also looked at what we were doing in mobile and we had a really strong presence with our sportacular on the iPhone right and we had built this great brand and great app already on the Android when it was sort of in its nascent stages so they saw we had a big head start on mobile and I think that they wanted us to, to, to be there I think a lot of it was just the people that were involved. They wanted to bring in that sort of institutional thinking about how to socialize Yahoo at a lot of levels, how to socialize Yahoo Sports. And um, I, I think that was really, really sort of the, the premise behind it. And so basically the entire team is over there now, minus you. Yeah, the you. entire team minus <laughs> me. So they thought everyone was important but me. No, um, you know, the, yeah, the whole team went over and, you know, they Yahoo kind of gave me an opportunity and the Citizen Sports team gave me the opportunity to do something that I really wanted to do, which was take a little bit of time off and work on this book, promote this book. Um, that's really been the focus for me since the sale. Mm -hmm. um, and it's somewhat been a focus for me before that. I, I've always, you know, for the last five or six years, I've done a, a corporate speaking gig where I've you know, flown around and spoken at different conferences and corporate events. And it's all been about sort of what are the business lessons that you can learn from both what we did in sports and what we did at the blackjack tables. And I'm definitely very passionate about that. So when the sale happened, it seemed like a great natural sort of end mm -hmm. to be able to go start working on this um, on a more full-time basis. And so that's what the book is. The book is a way to bring this message that you've been doing to the masses. Now. Yeah. So talk a little bit about it. What's, what's yeah, the, the book called? is called The House Advantage, Playing the Odds to Win Big in Business. And what I like to say is it's a business analytics book for people that would never ever pick up a business book. So one of the things that people will say about bringing down the house is people will come up and say, hey, I haven't read a book since high school and your book's the first book I read. And I kind of look at the house advantages that way too. I mean, there's a lot of complex concepts in there, concepts about you know, how to use data to make better decisions, how to make difficult decisions, but they're all told through gambling and sports stories. So you know, earlier you and I were talking and I was telling you about you know, one of the things I want to do is help people make better decisions, help people make hard decisions, help them avoid things like groupthink. Right. right? And, and groupthink is, is a difficult thing to, to overcome uh, because you don't know what people are going to say to you when you do it. You don't want the scorn. Uh, John Maynard Keynes is a famous economist. He, he said, you know, conventional wisdom will tell you that it's better to fail uh, conventionally than it is to succeed unconventionally. And that's a lot of sort of what this book is about. How do you challenge convention? So, you know, what I was talking about was the first time that I ever split tens in a casino. I had $8,000 on the table and I was at a $500 minimum table. So everyone else <laughs> at that table had real money down. Right. And when I said I was going to split these tens, they might have, I might have, you know, thought, gotten shot if one of them had been packing heat in the casino. <laughs> so I, you know, making that decision and why I was able to make that decision you know, not fearing failure, not falling for biases like loss aversion reminded me so much of when Bill why, Belichick... Why did you make that decision, though? Because the math told me yeah, to do it. Yeah, the math. It. Yeah, the okay. math I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated, but it's kind of simple in some ways. If you think about it, I had a pair of 10s and the dealer had a 6-up. Right. Now imagine that card counting, which I was doing, I know how many 10s there are versus how many low cards there are. Right. If, you, if I knew there were basically only 10s left, what should I do there? I should absolutely split them, right? That's right. going to increase my expected value. Right. You at least so, win one of the hands. Right. Which you would have won well, 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 I probably win. You know, if I think there's only tens left, I know that there's a really good chance that sh she's going to bust also the sure. dealer. So I'm going to make double what I would have won originally. Right. And it, it doesn't matter, right? And this is the hard thing to think about. It doesn't matter the fact that I already have 20, right? I'm trying to ultimately maximize how much money I can make. 
So regardless of whether I have almost a sure thing to make $8,000, if I have almost a sure thing or you know, slightly less than a sure thing to make 16,000, which is what would happen if I split, then I should take that because ultimately I'm trying to maximize revenue. Right. But that's a hard lesson for you to think about in a casino when you're sitting there with $8,000 <laughs> down and you know you got four people breathing fire at you that right. as soon as you want to split those. Ends, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so yeah, so you were talking about a little bit about the bell check. I well, yeah, think. and I, yeah. I equate, so a lot of what I did in my life was equating a lot of the blackjack decisions we made to sports decisions. Mm -hmm. And the Bill Belichick decision when he went for it on fourth and two and everyone killed him about it. And there were numbers of people that came out and said, hey, that was the right decision. Now, I don't care if it was the right decision or the wrong decision. I mean, I personally think it was the right decision, but that's not the important part to me. The important part is that he was able to make that decision and he was able to sort of challenge convention and make that decision. I was talking to Bill Simmons from ESPN about this and Bill looked at me and we kind of argued back and forth about it. And at the end, he looked at me and he said, well, it was the wrong decision. I said, how do you know that, Bill? He said, because it didn't work. <laughs> right. And I said, okay, well, that's terrible. I mean, if I have, if, and Bill loves to play blackjack, so I tried to explain to him blackjack terms. If you have 19, and the dealer has a seven up, but you decide to hit and happen to get a two to make 21. Does that make that a good decision? <laughs> right. Absolutely not, that was right. a terrible decision. So that's another theme in my book is the idea of how important it is to separate decisions from outcomes. Because when you look back on your life or on what you did in business or on your investment decisions, you can't look back and just say, what were the outcomes? You have to look at how your decisions were, how fit they were, whether they're right decisions at the time, because otherwise, you're never gonna, you're, you're always gonna either make the wrong decisions or you're never gonna learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there'll be other times where you make the wrong decision and you happen to get the right result. And that's just this idea, you know, when they talk about survivor bias or when you look at successful companies, you know, oftentimes if you only look at successful companies to figure out what makes them successful, you're gonna ignore the fact that there's a lot of people that were like that, that failed right, that sure. you never look at. Uh, great, yeah, sounds very interesting. Uh, one final question, where do you think LeBron is going? Yeah, that's, that's been a really popular thing. Um, I did something with ESPN about it where they were talking about how do you use you know, the same sort of house advantage type rules from your book to figure out what LeBron should do, how do right. you handicap that situation. Um, I wrote something today up about it which is interesting because I think he's gonna end up staying in Cleveland. Really? Uh, that's kind of what it's looking at. And what's interesting is I think he's falling prey to something called omission bias, which I talk about in my, my book. When you, uh, when you watch the average or the really bad blackjack player, mm -hmm. oftentimes they make mistakes by omission. So what that means is they're favoring inactivity over activity. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, hey, I've got 15 and the dealer's got a seven up. I don't wanna bust. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let the dealer take a card, mm -hmm. right? So what happens is they don't take a card the dealer flips a 10, makes 17, they lose, right? right. Um, that's a bad play. Mathematically, that's a bad play. We know it is. You can simulate that out 15 against a seven, you always hit, mm -hmm. no matter what. Right. Right. But they, are, they would rather you know, err by being inactive. They don't want to kill themselves. They basically. would rather maintain status quo. The other, right. the other thing I say is, you know those, those people that you see like a buddy or a, a girlfriend that's in a bad relationship? and every day they just keep going on with that relationship because they'd rather just deal with it like that than actually go through the harsh, active world of sure. breaking up with the person. Right. Well, that again is omission bias. So I kind of feel so like LeBron, LeBron is, going is going somewhat, right well, I mean, there's obviously more to it, right? I mean, right. there's, there's the, they, they can pay the him a little bit more, more money. money. Uh, there's the familiarity, there's, there's loyalty. You know, I'm gonna give him credit for all those things. Right. But at the end of the day, I think that Cleveland, just because he's there already, has a little bit more of a you know, weight in his mind than Chicago or than Miami or than the Nets. And I think that's a mistake. I think he's got to try to evaluate those all on an even playing field. And then if it comes down to the fact that he wants another few thousand a year or he'd rather hang out with his friends that, you know, don't you think all his Akron friends will probably move wherever he ends up? Sure. Right. So that's not an issue, right? right? His family will move with them. So is it the weather in Cleveland that he wants? Yeah, yeah the weather's great. Yeah. I'm from Cleveland. So maybe, yeah. So, <laughs> So, I mean, I kind of think he's going to end up there. That's just what I'm hearing right now, but you never really know. All right. Well, thanks a lot for taking yeah. the time, Jeff. And, Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah. Look for the book in bookstores. Great. All right.